All right, everybody, welcome back to Lecture 1B. This is the actual content for week number one for uh, professional skills for the research scientist. Uh, today, we're going to be covering the exhilarating topic of standard operating procedures. And I know everybody was just super excited when they saw this. They're like, oh my gosh, I've wanted to learn about these forever. Um, I can almost see the eyes rolling right now through the video screen, but I hope that after today's lecture, you'll start to understand why in science these can become so important. Uh, I still remember back to my days during graduate school. I like to tell a lot of anecdotes uh, because that's how I've gotten to learn some of the steps along the way. I have one particular mentor who did not believe in SOPs. He thought that they were counterproductive. He said that if you need an SOP, you don't know how to use that piece of equipment well enough and you shouldn't be doing it anyways. I will argue against that. I understand the rationale that you do need experience with all the procedures that you're going to be doing, especially if it's involved in some sort of data collection. But there's a lot of other reasons that you're going to need an SOP. And also, you're not necessarily going to be the person who's doing the procedures at all times. As you progress in your career, the t tasks you're going to be undertaking are going to be larger and larger. They're going to have more and more moving parts. There's going to be more people involved with them. And when that happens, you need to make sure that you're ensuring that the data is being collected in a good way. So we're going to go over the importance of that today. Uh, so we're just basically going to talk about what is an SOP, why we need them in science, how you can create one, and then we're going to go over the first assignment. And hopefully you guys will have a little bit of fun while you're creating your own SOPs, um, envisioning me trying to do whatever procedure that you're uh, um, uh, writing down. So, let's start with a quick definition of what an SOP is. Here we have a set of step-by-step -step instructions that help workers carry out routine operations that aims to achieve efficiency, quality output, uniformity of performance, while reducing miscommunications and failure to comply with regulations. That's a pretty all-encompassing uh, definition. But what I want to do now is kind of just go through a little bit of why we need SOPs in science. This would generally be the question and answer part, but since you know we are doing this asynchronously, I'll read these out to you and kind of write them down as we go here. The first reason, we have three main areas that we need SOPs. Number one is the most obvious for everybody who's in, in a lab day to day, collecting data as part of any sort of scientific procedure. You want to produce repeatable and comparable diet, uh, data. Let's change this text color just a little bit to make it easier to differentiate. And repeatable and comparable data. And what I mean by repeatable and comparable is repeatable means that if I ran the same analysis on the same sample on two different days, I would get the same value. Comparable means if I do a similar study five years later using the same techniques, I should get data that I can compare. Maybe in experiment one, people were resting and I looked at the values. And then in experiment two, people were exercising before I took the blood measurements, whatever we're looking at, whatever analyte, and the values are higher. If I know that I'm following a good SOP, I can presumably say, hey, these values are higher because these people were exercising, not because we did the procedure differently. Okay, So you want them to be comparable between different experiments, especially if those are completed by different people. Okay, Some things to consider when you're doing this. One, what if you have a multi-site data collection. For example, if you want to recruit a whole heck of a lot of people, you got to make sure that the, the data is being collected the same way. If you're doing a training intervention, they got to be doing the same exercises in the same ex, uh, order at each place. Another one is what if you have personnel turnover? This is a really hard thing with our labs here, as most of the students that we get in are master students. You're here for two years and then you're gone. If we don't have that exchange of information occurring in a reasonable manner, we can have one person doing a procedure one way and another person doing it a completely different way, and then we don't have that repeatable and comparable diet, uh, data. Also, we have, I know we have some undergrads in this class, so don't take offense, but we have undergrad, and I'm just using that for a uh, synonym for inexperienced.
I have physically watched an undergrad um, do some procedures, not in this lab, this was a previous institution. Um, all the undergrads I've had here have been amazing. There have been candidates for um, Nobel Peace Prize and all those sorts of things. Uh, but at a previous institution, I've seen them literally take urine samples that we needed for an analysis and just pour them right down the drain, right in front of me while I'm just sitting there being like, we should have had an SOP for that. Okay, so you have people who are inexperienced in the lab. As I said, as those projects get bigger and bigger, you need more people to help out. So having an SOP in place is going to be a way to assist those inexperienced people, make sure that they do those procedures in the correct way, uh, manner. The last one that I didn't really understand when I first saw it, uh, but I'm coming to find to be more and more important, is as a reference. There's going to be a lot of times in your career where you get to looking at your data when you're getting ready to publish, and you look at some of the numbers and you're like, why the heck is that number so funky? And a lot of times if you're in the lab a lot, you're going to be using a lab notebook that might be help it, helpful with this. But if you're you doing human subjects research, you might not have that lab notebook that goes along with it. So having an SOP will tell you, hey, this is how we did this, and that might be why our values are a little bit funny. Also, if you have a nice little reference, you can bring that with you from institution to institution to allow you to do the same procedure at different places. So having a nice reference uh, manual for what you've done in the past is going to be the, uh, another good reason to have SOPs. Okay, moving on. Let's move to number two here. Let's give ourselves a little bit of space. So for number two, this comes in as well. We think about safety. And the big example I like to give here is our bloodborne pathogen. Everybody here in the labs goes through the bloodborne pathogen training, but you be you know you you don't know in the background that Dr. Smith and I every year have to update our bloodborne pathogen uh, uh, SOP. How do we deal with them? What happens in our department specifically if we have a stick? What what do we do? What is the order of operations? We have that. So having that in place ensures safety and it ensures that that's going to be. Uh, taken care of in the same manner every time that either a good or a bad thing happens. So safety is number two. Last one was something that I didn't really consider until I read the reading that I uh, gave you guys for today, and this has to do with liability. It has a little bit to do with the safety that we just talked about, but if you're doing a clinical trial, either for the FDA or the National Institute of Health, both of those oversight uh, organizations can do site visits. If they don't see particular SOPs in place for things that could be potentially hazardous, they might cite your lab for being out of practice or not having an SOP for something that could be potentially dangerous. So if we want to make sure that we reduce our liability and have best practices overall, having SOPs is in place, we want to make sure that if any of those site visits ever should happen, you know, hopefully they don't because nothing goes wrong, but if they do, we want to make sure that we're buttoned up and ready to go. So our three main reasons there, number one, obviously we want to produce the best, most repeatable, and most comparable data we can. Two, we want to make sure that we're being safe all the time, um, you know, within our lab, within other people's labs as well. And third, we want to make sure that we're not getting sued or getting our grant funding removed because we didn't have an SOP in place. So. Let me just take a quick little break here. I'm going to show you a great video that I found about the importance of having good language during your SOP. I might break in for, uh, a couple points to just comment on some of the, uh, the commentary that's happening as well. And if you've seen this video before, feel free to skip forward um, about five minutes and uh, we'll catch up with you there. Purpose. You know what? I'm hungry. I could really go for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Okay. Do you guys think you can write down some instructions and teach me how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Yeah. I'm done. Step one. Get two pieces of bread out. Got them. Get a butter knife and get some PB. Take one piece of bread, spread it around with the butter knife. No. So I'm just pausing here to just comment briefly on this one. This person over here, this is me. This is lab director. This is all of the grad students out there. This right here's your new to the lab person. Here is your noob who's coming into the lab the first time. You say, hey, go do this thing. This is what they get, they're going to do. 
So this is why we want to have our SOPs in place. Dad, with the peanut butter. I'm just doing what it says. It says take one piece of bread, spread it around with the but with the butter knife. Hold on. Get some jelly, rub it on the other half of the bread. No, Dad, open the jelly. Well, it doesn't say to do that. Put the breads together on top of each other. Take a big bite. <laughs> Sorry, I had to I had to make it extremely specific. Oh good, I'm starving. Take two pieces of white bread out of the bag. Take the lid off the jar of peanut butter. Get a butter knife and stick it inside of the peanut butter jar. With the knife, scoop a bit of peanut butter out of A bit, of the... that means like a lot. A bit means a lot? Think we have to be specific with our language? Thanks, so. Al. In my world. All right. There we go. Doing better than before, though. Open the jelly jar. Squeeze it onto the other piece of bread. No. Done. Closer. Get two pieces of bread. Get some peanut butter. Take the peanut butter knife. Open the peanut butter. Put the knife in the PB. Get some jelly. Open the jelly. No. That's Squirt the jelly oh. onto the bread. Here's the butter. Take the butter knife with the peanut butter on it. <laughs> Wipe it all over the piece of bread that's blank. And I know this might re look ridiculous, um, but you have to think about this as a person who's maybe never used a pipette before. I have watched people go down two stops at the very beginning to draw into the pipette, saying, you know, press down on the pipette. There's a lot that goes into that, for example. There's other things. We have to make sure that we're specific with some of these SOPs. Now, if your SOP is going to be specific for people who might already be in the lab, we'll talk about that a little bit later, that you can change the wording based on who your audience is going to be. But if you got new lab people coming in, you want to be as specific as possible so you don't end up with a peanut butter jar all over your bread. Take the butter knife, rub the jelly all over the piece of bread. Oh, he's doing better. That's all over. Put the two pieces on top of each other. This is how I meant. Take two pieces of white bread out of the bag. Take the lid off the jar of peanut butter. Get a butter knife and stick it inside of the peanut butter jar. With the knife, scoop some of the peanut butter out of the inside of the jar. Spread your scoop of peanut butter onto one of your pieces of bread with a knife. No! Squeeze some jelly onto the other piece of bread. Spread the jelly on the bread with the butter knife. Put your two pieces of bread, peanut butter and jelly sides together. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Another important point here, editing. We're gonna get to this a little bit later as well. The first time you write an SOP, you're gonna be like, this is perfect. I've done it. I've written the perfect SOP. Nothing can possibly go wrong. And then you're going to give it to somebody else. They're going to try, and you're going to be like, no, no, ugh. And then you edit, and you edit, and you make it better, and you make it simple. Okay? Get two pieces of bread. Get some peanut butter. Get some jelly. Open the peanut butter. Get a butter knife. Put the butter knife in the peanut butter. Take the butter knife out of the peanut butter. <laughs> That's me watching the undergrad at my previous institution pour the urine sample down the drain. Hyperventilating. <laughs> you did it wrong. <laughs> no. <laughs> take one piece of bread and take the butter knife that has the peanut butter on it and spread it all over the top of the piece of bread. Dad, 
That's the top. I mean the sides. Squirt some on another piece of bread. Take the butter knife, rub it all over the top of the piece of bread. I quit. You know it ain't making any sense. Sorry you ruined it on purpose. He knows how to make one. <laughs> I know, Evan, it's the joke. It's the, it's the game that we're playing. Oh. Do you not eat a piece of bread? <laughs> you want to take your sandwich with you? I edited a bit. Take two pieces of white bread, take the lid off the jar of peanut butter, get a butter knife and stick it inside the peanut butter jar. With the knife, scoop some of the peanut butter out of the inside of the jar. Spread your scoop of peanut butter onto the face of one of your pieces of bread with the knife. Squeeze some jelly onto the other piece of bread. Spread the jelly on the bread with the butter knife. Put your two pieces of bread, peanut butter and jelly sides together. Done. Now eat it. Not the best. Well, you made it. But I think it qualifies. That's a win. All right, so I hope you get the point there. I know it's a little bit of a silly video overall, but I think it illustrates the points that we were talking about there pretty well. You got to be specific with your language. You got to assume that people don't know that what you're talking about when you use any sort of jargon or any labels. So let's move on now to a little bit of some of the types of SOPs. First, we're going to talk about lists, and this is primarily what you're going to see in the assignment. This is the type I'm going to ask uh, you guys to all develop. Uh, for your procedures. So for example, here's how to do a hematocrit percentage measurement. And this was an SOP I had one of my previous graduate students make for our lab right here. And what this does is it's really important for people who are coming to their, our lab because now they know how we do our hematocrit measurements. So the first thing you'll see up here is gathering materials. Okay, this is specific to one of our our uh, experiments where we had different visit numbers. So you can see that the visit numbers are in there. And what we say, here are the materials that we need to have. We need to have some heparinized microhematocrit tubes. We need to have some crew seal. We need to have some wipes, some hematocrit centrifuge that we have upstairs. And we need to have our hematocrit, hematocrit reader. One thing you'll know is when you go down to our microcapillary tube preparation section here, look at this. This is like my favorite part of this SOP. It's got the part number for the type of vacutainers that we use for the blood draw. This makes it super easy for your next graduate student who comes in and you say, okay, for this experiment, we want to make sure that we're measuring hematocrit. And that person says, okay, how do I measure hematocrit? Here you go. If it just said red top vacutainers, do you think a new graduate student is going to understand what a red top vacutainer is? Probably not. But if you got a nice little part number in there, it's going to be way easy for them to go on to um, Thermo Fisher or uh, VWR or something like that and place the order. So having those little details in there is really important. Then we can have our nice little steps. And you can see that within here we have some nice uh, reminders. It's important to cover the end of the capillary tube in order to prevent blood from leaking out. So this gives us a little bit of a rationale of why we're doing different steps. Okay, so step part number one, when we prepare the microcapillary tubes, part number two, centrifuging the microhematocrit tubes, and part number three, reading the hematocrit percentage overall. Look in here, we got some more safety measures. Caution, do not reach into the sharps container. This is something no rational person would do, but once again, we're going to have likely small children and they are trying to do something like this and we want to have every piece of information in there. This also goes back to the reasons we have these in the first place. We want to improve safety and we want to reduce liability. So a nice list based um, SOP here for how to read hematocrit. Number two, algorithm based. Okay, these are going to be ones you're going to use an algorithm-based SOP when you have something that requires a lot of decision-making. If we think about our hematocrit one, the previous one we looked about, there's no decision-making within that. All that is is you want to get a measurement, you have a tube, there's one way to get that measurement from that tube. Let's do this list. Do step one, do step two, do step three. An algorithm-based SOP is a little bit different. 
Here we're looking at an algorithm for suspected heat-related illness. So this tells us about a little bit of a treatment program. So let's say we're going to look at some of the, we see some of the signs related to heat illness. We see some disorientation, maybe a change in altered mental status. And the first thing we're going to do with every person is get a rectal temperature because that's the best way to diagnose. Okay, let's say that this person then has a temperature over 104. Now we have another decision to make. Okay, do they have central nervous system symptoms, signs and symptoms, meaning are they excessively angry for no reason? If they are yes, then we go treating immediately for heat stroke right here. We can be pretty sure that they have heat stroke, so we want to know that we're starting the intervention um, and rapid cooling and those sorts of things. But if they don't, they might have a more mild form because just having a temperature over 104 doesn't necessarily mean that you have heat stroke. So we're going to treat them for some of the other things, cramps, edema, syncope. Let's say they come in and they look disoriented overall, but we take the temperature and their temperature is low. Then once again, we see that they have no central nervous system signs. We're going to go for some of these mild heat related illness uh, right here because we can also have exertional heat illness with low body temperatures as well. If you go over here, let's say they have CNS symptoms, low temperature, um, then it might be something else that's dangerous, but not necessarily heat stroke. Okay, so if we treat for these and the symptoms resolve, this is the direction we go. If we treat for these and the symptoms don't resolve, maybe we start to cool them until their body temperature goes down, even if their temperature was a little bit low. Because like I said, we can have heat stroke without having a temperature over 104. So this is a great example of an algorithm based, which is pretty simple steps overall that are not too detailed, but have a lot of decisions that need to be made along the way. So this is a very good example of that. Next, we're going to move on to kind of a policy-based one, and this is overall. So this is from a previous institution I worked at, at Naval Health Research Center out in San Diego, and this was when we wanted to do any sort of exercise testing, what was the standard operating procedure for that? You might be able to find some of these institutional SOPs on our University of Wyoming Human Subject Research page. They have one for doing DEXA scans. They have one for doing exercise testing as well. And what this does is it tells you a little bit of the background of why we're doing this, and then it tells you some of the procedures and where to find these in some of the other uh, <clears throat> instruction manuals that are part of the Navy. Then it gives you basic steps. Okay, prior to any exercise test, the individual performing the test will alert the department head or acting department head when, where, and with whom it's take, the test is taking place. Look at that. That gets back to number two reason for having SOT, SOPs before uh, safety. Okay, these are the people who are going to be able to do it. These are low risk participants. Okay, we have our procedures in place in case something happens. And then people who may perform it at any point will familiarize themselves with this SOP. So basically, if you're going to do it, you've got to be understanding of this. So this is a very simple SOP, but this is a nice one to have on record somewhere close to where the testing is going to take place. So that if the testing is going to take place, we know that all these things are going to be take, taking place at every time. Okay, so let's move on. What makes an SOP good? We have some do's, we have some don'ts. Do's. Number one, we want it to be specific. If we go back to the peanut butter and jelly video a couple minutes ago, you understand why that language needs to be specific. So we'll not only say specific, we want specific language. Okay, number two, we also want it to be simple. This is not your chance to use big words uh, as part of your SOP. You want this to be understandable by anybody. Imagine your grandma coming into the lab and saying, oh, you know, I think I'm going to measure her hemoglobin today. If she has an SOP, she should be able to run it. Okay. Next, another way to make this a little bit easier, is something we didn't necessarily talk about, is labeling parts. If your new electrolyte analyzer has a flux, flux capacitor in it, and one of, the, one of the steps is, you know, make sure to add fuel to the flux capacitor. If a person comes in and hasn't read the instruction manual from front to back and the whole exploded view of all the parts like you have, it's important for you to label those. Maybe you put a little sticker on there with the letter A. And in your SOP, you say, add fuel to the flux capacitor, see label A. 
that's going to make it a lot easier for a new person coming in to find that part if there's a lot of parts involved in it. Sometimes a lot of these pieces of equipment have wacky names for different parts that aren't very intuitive. If you go through that first and understand it and label it, it's just going to make it a lot faster for everybody who's coming after you. Dues. Written by somebody who actually does the measurement. Or any procedure for that matter. It would be really hard if somebody who wasn't even close to the piece of equipment tried to write an SOP because I guarantee that person is going to leave out steps along the way and it's going to make mistakes and make it harder for everybody else. So it should be written by somebody who's performing that measurement. And the last one is kept close site. So whether this be a computer that you have, a centralized folder on that you can access that's nearby. You know, we used to have the MSDSs for all of our different chemicals on a folder right in our uh, uh, wet lab. That's very important. Uh, you don't want to have it way downstairs stashed away in a central office if it's going to be for a piece of equipment that's in a different building. Keep it close to the performance site so that if you need to reference it at any time, you can do that. Okay, what about some don'ts? Just some pretty simple ones here. No wall of text. Let's go back to our general. You don't want something that's just a giant paragraph to read. Not the methodology that you would see in a research manuscript overall. You want something that's going to be step-by-step, -step, simple language, keep it concise. If you, a person sees a wall of text, it's going to be really hard for them to pick up where they left off. So along with that, no paragraphs. And no overcomplicated language. Those are some of those pretty simple don'ts. Remove my apostrophe. What's going on here? Oh no, just don'ts. Plural. Okay. So let's finish up here with a nice little summary of what we've talked about, and then we'll get into the assignment. So overall, the summary. First, why are you going to do this in the first place? We know there's three reasons why we're going to do it. Number one is going to be for good data. This is the primary reason that people are going to write them. This is why your PI cares how you're going to write them and how you're going to keep them because they want good data. But we also have other reasons too. We want safe students. We want safe uh, research assistants. That's what we want. So safety is number two. And then number three, remember we said liability. God forbid we have anybody coming in to ever do a, uh, a lab review from one of our programs. But if, we, if they do, we want to make sure everything's in place. Okay, number two, how? Okay, number one, do the thing. So if you're going to write an SOP, get with your piece of equipment and do the measurement that you want to do. Let's do this just to make it a little bit easier. Then, after you do the thing, or while you're doing it, write down the steps. Number three, this is where, and a lot of times people will stop after step number two. Okay, I did it, I wrote the steps, we're good, now I can move on to whatever's next. But now steps three and four are really the most important part of writing an SOP. Number three, have a different person try to do the measurement or whatever your whatever task only by using your SOP. Okay. You're not going to give them any guidance along the way. You want them to be marginally uh, exposed to what you've been, what you're doing here, but they don't need to necessarily need to be an expert, obviously. Okay. Step number four: edit. Okay. So we're going to watch them as they're doing it, and you're going to see where they get held up along the way, and see where those sticking points are. Once you see those, you can go back in and edit. Maybe you want to try if they have a real hard time, have them try it again or give it to somebody else. It depends on the importance of what you're doing. How uh, close do you need this to be? Who's your audience that it's going to go to? Is it a very complicated procedure that a lot of inexperienced people are going to be doing? Then you want to make sure this thing is really tight. 
okay? If it's not quite, if it's only going to your lab mates who you've been working with for a long time and it's not going to be used in the future, you can be a little bit more lenient with that. And the number of times that you repeat that step three and step four are all going to be dependent on that. The last step here is <clears throat> when to revise. And this is different than the edit that I have above. This is more about revisions to it. And you're going to want to do this once a year. Just go back, look at your SOP, and see, does it still make sense what we're telling people to do? Have we had any updates to the software that we're using with our piece of computer? Maybe we need to change the SOP. Also, you're going to want to do a test of your SOPs before every data collection, every new data collection. Okay? So before your new data collection, you want to test out your SOP to see if it works. And then along with your revision, keep old versions. Okay, you need to keep those old versions because you're going to need those as a reference in case something changes. Maybe your values look different from an experiment you did five years ago. If you look back at those old versions, you'll be able to see why. Okay, let's move on. Let's finish up with what your SOP assignment is. Do next Thursday, February 6th. I want you to create an SOP for a task that I can complete. I'm going to try all of these, and that's how I'm going to be able to tell if they're good or not. Okay. Make it for a task that I can complete either at home or somewhere here on campus. Okay, Use the list-based format that we had above on you know, page number three of the outline here. There must be at least 10 steps. So this can't be something as simple as you know, putting sugar in my coffee. I know how to do that just fine, so don't worry me an SOP for that. Okay, Then I'm going to be grading this on the formatting, what's the language like, and what's the overall ease of following. Okay. I'll be selecting a few to review in my next lecture, so um, make sure that you understand that I might be using these as kind of an example of, here's an area where we could, really could have improved that, or here's something that I really liked about this one that I didn't even talk about before. Here's a, a procedure you guys might want to use in your next SOP. However, with that, I'm going to give this little 5A point here. Maybe you don't really want yours to be included in the lecture, and I understand that. I still want you to do the assignment, but if you prefer not to have your um, SOP included in the lecture, just include a little note with your submission that comes in to only me to let me know, hey, you know what, Dr. Johnson, I like this assignment, but I prefer if you didn't share this with the rest of the class. Totally fine. Understand it. Just let me know beforehand. All right. With that, that covers our lecture for SOPs. I'm really looking forward to looking at the discussion board as we start to see that develop over the next week and to trying out some of your SOPs when you turn them in next Thursday. So I appreciate it. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you soon.